Good evening everyone and welcome to Ask Leah on Facebook Live tonight. It's an exciting week to be doing Facebook um, Live tonight for a couple of reasons, particularly tonight. One, my beloved Pies are playing in the grand final this week, which is very exciting. I know that will be enough to make some people nearly turn off their cameras um please don't get on board we are nice people as um gold Sack said this week the other exciting um uh, thing that has happened for me today is that in the early hours of this morning i sent the first draft of my manuscript for my business book soft is the new hard how to communicate under pressure to my editor so with that in mind, I think that a glass of red is needed to celebrate tonight's uh, Facebook Live. So grab your wine, grab your tea, grab your coffee, settle in because I have four really cracking and diverse uh, questions to get through tonight. The first one is something that's quite dear to me um, because it's to do with volunteers and how to communicate well with volunteers when you're part of a volunteer organization to get the best out of people and as a lot of you know i am on a lot of different commu uh, committees in our community and there are some key learnings for communicating with volunteers and i'll run you through a few of them there's many more than these but here's a few to kick you off um, the first one is you really need to show appreciation to volunteers even if you're a volunteer yourself even if you're giving a lot of yourself uh, it's a big mistake to kind of go well come on everyone i'm putting in a lot you should be too people have different expectations different time commitments that they can make so it's really important if someone is volunteering their time make them feel appreciated make them feel valued um, Number two is set expectations early. If you are part of a committee or a group, make sure everyone is really clear on what the role of those, that group as a whole is, but also the role of individual volunteers. How are you going to make decisions? Is it going to be unanimous? Um, is it majority rules? Uh, you know, how are you going to communicate? How often are you going to meet? What's the time commitment involved? You really need to set expectations early. Now, if you are part of an established uh, volunteer group, then absolutely still you can do this now. Uh, you, ideally, you do it at the start, but you can do it at any time. So set expectations early. Ask people to do specific tasks. Um, I'm sure you've all had this happen, whether in a volunteer group or even in the workplace, where if you just put a general request for help out there, you hear crickets chirping, no one chips in. So make sure that if you need help or you need a task done, you be really specific about what that is. So instead of just putting it out there, hey, we need more helpers, you know, many hands make light work, jump on board, be specific, you know. It might be, hey, we've got a, a barbecue happening this weekend. We need someone to volunteer between 12 and 1 o'clock. Can you help? Okay, so be as specific and targeted as you can. Um, this is a tough one, particularly for me, but for lots of people. Hi, Tanya, welcome. Um, you've got to let it go a bit in terms of how the tasks are done. If you need something done, you know, that getting the outcome is the important thing, not necessarily how it's done. I have seen, and look, I have been guilty of it myself before, where you've got high expectations of how something is done or you've got a process that works for you and someone else who's volunteering does it a different way and it can be easy to get your back up and sort of go, hey, you know, no, you should be doing it this way, but you know what? If they are volunteering, if they are still getting the outcome and they're going about it a slightly different way, let that go. And my last high end, my last um, tip with working with volunteers is always have an agenda for meetings. Um, yes, it might be a bit of a social catch up as well, whether it's your kinder committee or a sporting club, uh, whatever it may be, have an agenda for meetings, have a start and an end time for your meetings. And 
you know, maybe have dinner afterwards or, you know, people at the end can hang around and chat in general, but you want to keep things on track. You do that because you want to show that you value people's time. You will lose volunteers very quickly if your meetings go for three hours. Okay, yes, you'll keep those social people, but you'll lose the people that are under the pump and don't have that time commitment. So always have an agenda. So that's just some of my tips for dealing with volunteers. Um, there are many more, as I said. The second question uh, goes down a different track. It's dealing with difficult people. Hi, Hannah. Hi, Kel. Um, this person wrote to me and said they're struggling a bit working with people who are really vocal and really negative about their workplace, their colleagues. Um, they said they always run down their boss. And their question was, should they speak up or just ignore this negativity from the people around them? And my suggestion is something called the no triangle approach and the no triangle approach is one that Rachel Robertson who is uh, a wonderful speaker I think I've spoken about her on the show before um, wonderful speaker and leadership expert led an Antarctic expedition um, at the age of 35 she's an Australian woman absolutely remarkable but she's got this great concept called no triangles and I would encourage uh, the person who wrote to me about this to say to their colleagues, you know what, I actually believe in a no triangles mode of communication. And what that means is that if I have an issue with someone, I'll have a conversation with them directly rather than, you know, speak about it to other people and create a triangle. Now, I do that in my communication and what that means is I also work really hard not to be part of other people's triangles. So I'd really appreciate it if you didn't speak to me about other people because I believe that the best way to deal with those situations is to have a conversation with them directly. Now, the other person might get their nose out of joint a bit. Um, bad luck okay you don't want that you don't want to be sucked into those sort of conversations you don't want to be part of it you don't want that dragging you down as well you can be really respectful you know you don't have to shut it down and be aggressive but you know hey look I follow this no triangles approach what it essentially means is I don't talk about you with someone else and you don't talk about me with someone else okay if you do, if everyone in your workplace follows no triangles, I tell you what, it really changes the dynamics of that workplace. Um, and I'll jump in with yours now. President of a local netball club, how do you deal with rogue members who agree to motions but renege the next day? Oh, yeah. Okay. So you really you can't it's it, that comes down to how the meetings are run and again i would get very clear on those expectations as um, i mentioned in that previous one you need a decision making process i'm actually running a workshop for latrobe city community groups in a few weeks time on decision making processes for community groups with on this exact sort of topic in terms of you know how do we set up a framework so that our process for making decisions is clear um, so that you don't have this risk of rogue members then going and reneging the next day. It needs to be a really clear understanding that decisions made in meetings, people are bound by them. So I would really recommend, and you don't want to address that in the moment in conflict or the, you know, at that heated time. What you want to do is um, at a next meeting say hey we need to get clear on our process for decision making and what the expectations of, are of members at our meeting you know get a whiteboard out do a big brainstorm but really get everyone on board in what is okay and what's not okay what people are bound by and what they're not so that then if someone does go and try to renege you've really got uh, the grounds to say actually you know, as we're all aware, as we all agreed, this is how our meetings and decision making process work. So we are bound by that. So I really get those expectations clear as quickly as you can by the sounds of it. Um, question that came through uh, today, actually, 
how to deal with daily professional interactions with someone you just don't like. Here's the thing. There will be people you work with that you don't like. That's just a fact of life, okay? And guess what? Some people won't like you either, no matter how nice you try to be. It is just life. We get on with some people, you know, we don't with others. The key thing, though, comes down to not the other person and how they're behaving. It comes down to you. It is a personal choice about the type of person you want to be and how you as an individual behave. How do you want to be known in the workplace? Do you want to be known as a professional person who is respected? If that is your aim, then you are polite, respectful to everyone, even people you don't like. Okay, now it's not about being fake or inauthentic or sucking up someone's butt when you really don't like them, but it is about professional courtesy. You're not at high school, okay? You're not at um, the footy club on the weekend or at a mate's place. You are in the workplace. You are a professional and you behave as such, even if you don't like the other person. What I do suggest, though, is if you find that you don't get on with someone or you just don't like them, Really question yourself on why and what it is about their behaviour um, or the way they act that you don't like. Sometimes you can actually get some great learnings out of that in terms of what not to do yourself. I know that was a position I found myself in earlier this year where I worked with someone who I really did not get along with. It was actually not pleasant, but it was a great learning for me because I was able to look at their behaviour and say, wow, this is what's really rubbing me up the wrong way with how they're behaving. I need to make sure that I never fall into that myself because I know how uncomfortable and not cool it is for me and I don't want to be putting someone else in that position ever either. Um, and our last question tonight, if there's no more that come through, is one about how important is it to use the right jargon in the right workplace. And this came through from someone who sort of bridges two different worlds, uh, you know, a not-for-profit, which they're heavily involved in, but then also corporate. And although they have very similar processes, the language used around them is quite different. Um, this, for those who have been to my workshops or, or hear me bang on about this, corporate jargon, um, waffle, talking around an issue drives me bonkers. And I know it comes back to my journalism background where you are taught to convey messages as simply, succinctly and clearly as you can. Now, while yes, that's important for journalism, I argue that that is important in any workplace, okay? Plain speak is powerful. The skill is not in making something sound complicated. The skill is in being able to distill complex messages to simple, succinct, um, clear statements, okay? You will find that you get people in corporate who will wax lyrical and talk in all of this jargon and if you actually say to them, that's great, what does that mean? They won't be able to tell you, okay? If you can't sum something up simply and succinctly, you probably don't know what you're talking about. You're probably trying to cover it up in those, you know, big, flowery, fluffy words. But the reality is you don't know your message well enough. That said, there is a standard that you have to meet in different workplaces. There's language that you use. Some workplaces use formal language. You know, the obvious one here is legal, okay? If you're getting up in court, you can't do a Dennis Denudo from the castle where you get up and say, man, it's just the vibe of the thing. Um, yes, it works in the movies, but in a courtroom, that's not going to fly. You have to speak in their jargon. In some corporates, that's the case too. But I always get back to that argument of don't just use words because they sound good or they're fluffy or, you know, you really need to know what you're saying. So if you work with people who are very jargony, you know, 
one of the ways to pull that back a bit is to say is to ask questions not in an antagonistic way just but to sort of say you know to get to help me be clear on that what do you mean when you say that and really try to do uh distill it down um you know to the person that asked me this question i know you're a really good communicator and i encourage you to um you know to keep doing what you're doing keep going with that plain speak but recognise that you sometimes do have to cross into that other language um, in the corporate space. Acronyms are the other big one, folks. You know, where you talk in abbreviations and acronyms, you know what you're talking about. You know what you're talking about with someone else from that organisation, but the minute you get an outsider in or you're trying to convey your message to the community, they have no idea what you're banging on about. So really be careful with corporate jargon and waffle and embrace the plain speak so that's it from me tonight unless anyone's got a last minute question they want to shoot through again i want to thank you all for tuning in i want to thank everyone for the uh, the love they gave me today the shout outs as you can see big bags under my eyes i was early hours of this morning finishing the the last touches on my manuscript i was up early this morning uh having a great chat to bryce on gippsland fm about networking and building relationships of influence and i'll post that conversation at a more respectable time than 6 20. Um, i'll post that tomorrow morning probably about 8 30 or so so you can have a listen to that go pies on saturday Cheers to kicking massive goals. I think I'll probably talk about how I did that next week. Um, it's been a huge four months in my business. It's been a huge four months for me personally, yet I still ticked off that huge goal. And I didn't do that because I'm superwoman, because I tell you what, I'm not. I did it through hard work, goal setting, and setting a really clear plan. So thank you for that. Thanks for tuning in again. Can't wait to get your questions for next week and have a fab weekend. Get on board the Black and White Army. Cheers, everyone.